Roger. Thanks everybody for coming. I think we've got a great crowd. And so we're going to try to keep this a little, you can see by our casual appearance here, we're going to try to keep this a little conversation. We're going to have a little bit, but we're going to try to include as many as we can in it. So we're going to start out with a question for the audience. How many people think they are uh, to the right of center? Okay. How many people think they're to the left of center? Okay. So we have a pretty good amount of each, and that's, that's good. And so one of the themes I was telling Senator Lee that I wanted to get to is where right and left come together. Okay? We, everybody says there's such great acrimony, and everybody's yelling at each other. I walked down the hall the other day, and someone was yelling at me, kidnapper, kidnapper. And I was like, who did I kidnap? What did I? I don't remember that. I don't even remember who for kidnapping. Um, but we get kind of a little bit crazy with each other. But I think right and left do meet on some issues. Now, when they teach political spectrums, you remember they used to teach there was a circle, and then there was a, there was a linear one. The circular one always made me mad because they said the more conservative you got, you got closer and closer to authoritarianism. The more liberal you got, the closer and closer you got to Marxism or totalitarianism from the left. And they wound up and right and left joined in this massive uh, belief in government. I always thought it was more linear that we started with either zero government went to complete government. But there still is somehow right and left coming together. And I'll give you a short story and then I'm going to flip it over to Mike. I was on the floor the other day and Bernie Sanders comes up to me and he says, uh, and he kind of looked with a sly grin on his face and we were talking about war. And Mike can tell a little bit more about the issue. It was the, war, the Yemen war issue. And he said, yeah, you, you conservatives, and he knew I wasn't one that he was referring to, but he says, you conservatives, talk all about the Constitution all the time, all about the rule of law, all about the founder's intent, until you want to talk about war, and then you completely ignore and forget the founder's intent on foreign policy and war. And uh, I think there is some truth to that. And I would flip it right back to Bernie if you were here, and I would say, yeah, but on economic liberty, you guys tend to completely ignore the intent of the founding fathers, which was a very limited government in that aspect also. But I think with that, I'd like to flip it over to Mike and ask him, what was the issue you worked with Bernie recently that had to do with Yemen? Maybe tell them a little bit about what the what is going on in Yemen, because a lot of people don't know, and then what you guys were proposing. We're fighting, uh, basically, as co-belligerents, an unconstitutional war. I think what might be working. You got to flip it to on. I think. Still not working. There we go. It turns out you have to turn the thing on for it to work. <laughs> um, we're essentially fighting a war, uh, not directly, but indirectly, as co-belligerents in Yemen. Uh, we're doing so by providing significant military assistance to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which is in turn involved in fighting this civil war in Yemen against the Houthi rebels. Here's the problem with that, or one of the many problems with that. In order to declare war under our constitutional system, you have to have a declaration of war by Congress. In modern parlance, sometimes that takes a different form, and they call it an authorization for the use of military force. I don't know how that convention started, uh, but it's essentially the same thing. We don't have that here. We've had actions taken now by two presidents, one Democrat and uh, another a Republican. Uh, authorizing our ongoing involvement in that war. And so, not too long ago, we had an unlikely group of allies who came together on this. And Senator Bernie Sanders uh, is a, uh, a progressive independent from Vermont who caucuses with the Democrats in the Senate. And I'm never described with any of those adjectives. Um, I, I, I'm a, a very conservative, some would say libertarian, leaning uh, conservative, uh, a constitutional conservative, as I put it, from Utah. But he and I agree, along with Senator Paul and a handful of other Republicans and Democrats in this body, it's very important that when we put American blood and treasure on the line, we do so as the Constitution ordains. And the, the Constitution appropriately puts that decision in the hands of Congress, knowing that Congress is the branch of the federal government that is most accountable to the people at the most regular intervals. We came close to winning that. We were only, I think, uh, seven or eight votes away from winning it. But that battle's not over yet. We're going to have other opportunities to make our mark there and to return the power back to where it belongs with the people. 
And as we had the debate, what was interesting about this is when you talk about the founder's intent, to a person, every one of them, even you think there's a difference between Jefferson and Hamilton, not on war necessarily. When you, when you discuss or read the Founding Fathers, you read the Federalist Papers, every one of them says that they deliberately gave this power to Congress. They wanted it to be more difficult to go to war. They saw the continual wars, perpetual war in Europe, and they wanted to make sure that war wasn't easy to have happen. So Madison uh, is one of the most famous quotes on this, and he says that the executive branch is the branch most prone to war. Therefore, the Constitution, with studied care, gave that power to the legislature. But we have a whole body of, of, of people, many of them Republicans, probably more of them Republicans, we won't name them, we'll just call them Lindsey Graham, um, <laughs> who believe in what is called unlimited article to authority. If he were here, he would say that the president can do whatever he wants, and if you want him not to go to war, you can defund the war. That's not what they intended. They gave us the final recourse of defunding war, which is very, very difficult, but they gave us the ultimate power, which was initiation of war. But I want you to mention, Mike, what the generals and what the administration told you why we weren't fighting war. They, they said we weren't involved in hostilities. Yeah, uh, this was truly surreal. A lot of this discussion occurs in what's called a skiff uh, here in the Senate. It's a, a kind of an underground bunker uh, that you go into. You have to leave all of your electronic devices, anything that can transmit, and then they'll give you a classified briefing. And it's in that setting that they make some of their best and worst arguments about why they can do this. One of the arguments they raised was based on a letter that some lawyer within the Department of Defense had written in 1975. And I kid you not, it said basically, as long as we don't have troops on the ground fighting against each other, shooting on each other while on the ground, on a battlefield against each other as two sovereign nations, it's not a war. Now, I, I embellished that only slightly, but the, uh, that was about as, as narrow as they would confine the concept of war. And that short of that, the president as commander-in-chief could just order just about any kind of military strike uh, that the president chose to do. This is one of the other things that, that, that we should look to the founding era to discern. You look at the Federalist Papers and they identify the fact that the presidency was different than the monarchy in this critical respect. In Great Britain, the king had the authority to go to war without parliament. Parliament could make a number of other decisions, but the decision to go to war belonged to the king. Our founders made a conscious choice not to give that to our chief executive. So um, the Saudis have dropped 64,000 bombs. Um, Sometimes they bomb people with uniforms and guns. Sometimes they bomb civilians. Uh, they bombed a funeral procession, killed 150 people, and wounded 500. And we ask ourselves, how are terrorists created? And there's this argument all the time. And George Bush told us they hate freedom and they hate our way of life. It's probably a little more complicated than that. I mean, because if you ask them, they don't say we hate American freedom and your way of life. They hate our involvement in their wars, and they've been at war with each other for a thousand years. So anyway, bombing is not war because there aren't people on the ground, but it's even worse than that. We do have American troops on the ground in Yemen. They say, oh, well, they're not fighting the Houthis, they're fighting Al-Qaeda. So those don't count. So it's this bizarre situation where we have several hundred troops on the ground in Yemen, but they're not fighting the Houthis, and so they say, well, we don't have hostility because bombing's not hostility. Where did this nonsense start? It started in Libya. We fought a war in Libya that was all bombing, but you remember the words kinetic action? We were not at war, we were at kinetic action, whatever that means. So we dumbed down the language. Does anybody think of George Orwell when we, the words become meaningless or they become the opposite of what they mean? War no longer means war. So uh, this is kind of where we are. These are important debates because you're the people who fight these wars. The young people fight wars and your generation. We haven't fought. I mean, we, we've been at war in Afghanistan now for 17 years. So, you know, at first I said I was against Pompeo, and then I ended up voting for him. I got nothing from brief from both sides. Now everybody hates me because I voted for him or against him. And because I was against him, they hated me. Now they hate him because I voted for him. But here's the point. I asked Pompeo, I said, you know, is there a military solution in Afghanistan? And he said, no. I'm reading a book by Stephen Cole right now. It talks about Afghanistan and Pakistan. In 2010, Richard Holbrook writes a secret memo to Clinton, and he says there is no military solution. 
We have the head of the UN saying it, the head of NATO saying it. Every world leader virtually has said there is no military solution, and yet what do we do? We send more troops. So Obama's response to this was to wind down the Iraq war, but to greatly expand the Afghanistan war. Over 100,000 troops went there. Taliban did flee, but they gradually come back. They live there, or they live across the border in Pakistan. But it's one of these things we should debate, and then we should debate whether we should go to war. So we had a hearing the other day, and Mike can mention a little bit about this, on discussing whether or not we should authorize all of these different wars we're at. The process of the Constitution says yes, we either should authorize them or not authorize them. But that's the first part of the debate. Now some people are wanting to authorize them, but Mike and I are concerned they authorize too much war. Do you want to talk about that hearing or anything like that? Yeah, lines? sure. Uh, one of the problems that can arise is if, in the first instance, if you've got Congress just acquiescing to presidential, presidentially directed military action, uh, that's a problem. And you can also have a problem if Congress steps in and says, okay, we don't want the president acting utterly without authority. So why don't we just, um, let's authorize a really broad military action. Let's pass something, an authorization for the use of military force that says, Mr. President, we hereby authorize you to go after the bad guys. Go after people who pose a threat to us uh, without any more specification than that, without naming a specific country, a specific regime to be toppled. Uh, or, or naming a whole bunch of them and then leaving it open-ended. Uh, that amounts to an abdication of the congressional responsibility in much the same way that it would be an abdication for us to do nothing uh, if the executive branch is carrying on a war. So after 9-11, we voted on a proclamation. Originally, George Bush wanted it to be more wide open. Congress insisted that it be narrow. And if you read it, I think it's 60 words. It's pretty narrow. We're supposed to go after those who attacked us on 9-11, those who aided and abetted them, or harbored them. Period. Nothing else. So all, war in Yemen has nothing to do with 9-11. Even the war in Afghanistan has nothing to do with 9-11. I asked everybody, I asked Pompeo this, I said, tell me one person, tell me their name, who had something to do with 9-11 that we're still trying to get. We now have people being born and fighting these wars on our side and their side that were born after 9-11. You, know, you guys were probably born just a little before 9-11, but don't remember it probably as small kids. We now have soldiers fighting, and there's no new proclamation, and it's not the same war. So we should be having this debate whether or not we're at war. The, uh, another issue that we have been working a lot on, and Mike and I both had a big interest, is the idea of whether or not uh, you're presumed to be innocent and you get a right to a trial by jury. And you're thinking... Who in their world, could, in the whole United States, who could be a leader in the Senate and possibly be opposed to a right by trial by jury and the presumption of innocence? We won't say any names of Lindsey Graham. And um, so we've been fighting him. He's been blocking this amendment for six years. And Mike, why don't you tell him a little bit about how indefinite detention got started and what it is? In the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2012, uh, which I believe came up during the first full year that Senator Paul and I were in office, they added a section, section 1032, I believe it was, that purported to give the U.S. government the authority to indefinitely detain, without charge or trial, American citizens, even American citizens detained on U.S. soil, based on the nature of the charges against them. In other words, if you were charged with being a terrorist, if you were charged with, for example, materially assisting al-Qaeda, uh, then you could be indefinitely detained without a lawyer, without a grand jury indictment, without access to a jury trial, without the right to cross-examine your accusers. All of these things that are part of what we call due process, that are part of the uh, explicit enumerated protections in the Bill of Rights could be taken away from you. Now, that is not to say that there aren't bad people in this country. It's not to say that there aren't U.S. citizens on U.S. soil who might do us harm. But what that does remind us of is the fact that when you're a U.S. citizen on U.S. soil, you have the right to certain protections. Those can't simply be taken away from you by statute. Um, in fact, we fought a war over that. In fact, in some respects, we have fought several wars over that. Um, the, the government's not supposed to be able to do that to you. So we put together some legislation called the Due Process Guarantee Act. This is bipartisan legislation. I drafted it. My, my lead Democratic co-sponsor is Dianne Feinstein. She and I don't agree on everything, but we serve together on the Judiciary Committee. 
And this basically undoes this section 1032 of the 2012 National Defense Authorization Act. We ended up getting 67 votes for that in the next go-round in the NDAA for fiscal year 2013. Inexplicably, that provision was removed uh, shortly before the uh, competing House and Senate versions of the bill were reconciled. This was back in 2013. Back in 2013. We've been trying ever since then to get a vote on it. Again, we finally had that chance week before last. And one member was able to utilize his... We won't name any names. We won't name any names, but it was Lindsey Graham. <laughs> decided to use his prerogative, given the unique procedural posture we were in, to block that amendment. And then uh, they ended up moving to table uh, the amendment to this year's Defense Authorization Act that would have included this Due Process Guarantee Act. Well, in the motion to table, we had 68 senators voting no on the motion to table, meaning voting with us, saying the government ought not be able to do that thought this was relatively non-controversial. It is relatively non-controversial in, in that it's uh, kind of hard to get 68 senators to agree to any particular change to a Defense Authorization Act. But yeah, on this occasion, we did. But because of the fact that it was a motion to table and not a motion to pass it, and we had one senator objecting to us to getting an up or down vote, we still are left with this indefinite detention problem on the books. Culture matters, and our law affects our culture, our culture affects the law. We don't ever want U.S. citizens getting accustomed to the idea that based on the nature of the accusations against them, they can be held indefinitely without charge and without trial. Right, and you know, we've done this before. Do you remember in a time in our history when we accused people of something and we just took them to the edge of town? It was called lynching. And you say, well, they, you know, what were they accused of? They're accused of bad things, rape and murder, but nobody knows if they did it. Terrorists are accused of bad things. Nobody has, we have no sympathy for terrorists. We've tried 386 in our country, 71 of whom were not citizens, who were caught in our country and accused of terrorism. Every one of them has been convicted. They've gotten a lawyer though, and they've gotten a trial. Why? Because we make mistakes, and we want to make sure that we convict the right people. Of the people who were tortured, we tortured 125 people, our CIA and intelligence agencies did. 26, in retrospect, were the wrong people. This is out of Feinstein's torture report. 26 out of 125. But there was a period of time in our history where you went to the edge of town and you would accuse a black man, typically, of a crime, and you strung them up. That's what we're talking about here, the presumption of innocence and the right to a trial by jury. And to me, this is just outrageous and just, just it, it just makes my, my skin crawl that we have people opposing a vote on that. We've gotten to 68 people believing you should have a right to a trial by jury. But if you read on the internet, and I'll read the comments sometimes, my staff tells me never read the comments on your Twitter, but I'll read it and people are like, oh, who's he wants to give Miranda rights and trials to terrorists? Well, first of all, we're talking about in this country. We're not talking about overseas in a battle. That's a little bit different. And really, your amendment, my amendment, none of it would apply to overseas. It's to people here, but yes, here, yes. But the thing is, if someone rapes somebody or is accused of rape in Washington, D.C. tonight, someone will be arrested, even as heinous as that crime is, they will get a lawyer in a trial. Why? Because they might not be the right person. You, you know, you have to have this idea of presumption of innocence. And so you say, well, this is, one of our colleagues said he wasn't voting for it because it's never been used. And this is actually what President Obama said when he signed it. He said, this is a horrendous power, and I will never use it. But really, the law is not about having good people apply the law. The law is supposed to be so good that when you get a bad person in, they're not allowed to abuse it. You know, we had the same thing. I remember before I ran, we had the Kilo case that the gov said the government can take your property if the next person that's going to use the property pays higher taxes. They take it through eminent domain. And I remember my mayor saying, oh, but you know me. And she was a patient of mine. You know me. I won't take anyone's property. It's not about you. It's about the autocrat that might be mayor after you that decides to use eminent domain. The laws are about not about good people. They need to restrain bad people from doing bad things. So to Mike and I, this is a very big fight. To many other people, it doesn't matter. But it goes to a much bigger issue, this idea of presumption of innocence and, and right to trial by jury. Brings up an important point. Um, James Madison explained the relationship between human nature and government in Federalist 51. 
Um, if you forget everything else uh, I say today, just, just remember this. Read Federalist 51 when you get a minute. He explains that government is one of the greatest exercises in human nature. It informs us about who human beings are. You know, we, we are flawed by nature. We're not perfect. Uh, we're redeemable, but we're flawed. And we're prone to make mistakes. He explains that if we were all angels, we wouldn't need government because we would always treat each other with kindness, with decency. We wouldn't hurt other people and we wouldn't take their stuff. If not being angels, we need government, which we do. If we then had access to angels to administer our government, that government would be fair and just and perfect because the angels wouldn't hurt people and they wouldn't take their stuff. They would just administer the law fairly. But we're not angels. We don't have access to angels to run our government. So what we have to have instead is a series of rules, very strict rules, about what human beings can do to other human beings. When we get into problems in this town, in this government, and in government generally, is when we start to attribute a degree of omniscience and omnipotence to a government, to the federal government in particular. Some people are awed into a humble obedience by a government that's capable of building these enormous aircraft carriers or these weapons systems like the F-35. Uh, they, they, they can inspire a sense of uh, uh, overwhelming power to the point that people will put too much trust in government, forgetting that governments are nothing more than a collection of people who have been imparted some authority by other people to administer their affairs. When you forget that, you run into problems. One more thing on this indefinite detention point that ties in to Federalist 51. Uh, remember what happened in the 1940s when our government decided to imprison a couple hundred thousand Japanese Americans simply because they were Japanese. They were detained without charge, without trial, without access to a jury, without access to a lawyer that could help them in any meaningful way. We did it based on a suspicion. To this day, to our knowledge, we didn't thwart one act of war against the United States by doing that, but we deprived a whole lot of people, many if not most of whom were U.S. citizens, law-abiding ones at that, of their due process rights. We can't let that happen again. So just remember, human nature is a real thing. It's got to be taken into account. And governments are run by fallible, flawed, mortal human beings. That's why the rules matter. One last point on this is that I would say is that if we live in fear of terrorism so much that we change and give up on what is fundamentally who we are, trial by jury, presumption of innocence, because we're so afraid or we're so mad, um, who will it want? Will we have lost really the war? Will the people who are attacking us have won if we transform our system to be a system that, you know, if you're crossing the border and you've got brown skin and an Arabic name, then we're going to look at your phone. Or we're going to force you or put you in jail and look at your phone. That's actually something we're fighting now. Should you be forced to give your password when you come across the border? We have a bill that says you should get a warrant. I'm not saying we never look at your cell phone. You go to a judge and you have to get a warrant. We have to go. I think Mike's going to have to leave pretty quickly, but you got time for a few questions? So we'll do a few questions uh, now, and then uh, as long as they're easy questions. When we start back here, and there's a. Oh, go to the microphone. If you're lined up with the microphone, I think that might be better. Anybody else wants to go and get people behind her in line and get set up? Anybody else has a question? We'll start making their way. Okay, so I have two questions for Senator Lee. Um, I know you voiced support for paid leave through, like, funded through Social Security. Have you guys made any progress on a bill about that? We're, we are examining a series of proposals that would allow this to happen. Nothing has been reduced to legislative text or introduced yet. The idea behind this is that when someone has a baby, uh, they've been paying into Social Security for years. They will be paying into Social Security for years. They ought to have the option, if they so choose, uh, to delay by a few weeks their retirement date for purposes of Social Security in order to receive some of that benefit while they take some time off to spend time with their baby after, after having a baby. Would you support paid leave funded through something else? That's just my second question. Um, 
this is the model we're looking at right now. So uh, uh, at this point, that's what we're focusing on. I, I, I don't know if I can engage in hypotheticals beyond that. Thank you so both so much for coming to speak to us today. One of the biggest things for those of us working on the Hill have been hearing from constituents about the crisis or the situation at the border. And I wanted to get both of your opinions on what are your views on the process of illegal immigrants coming in uh, and the due process rights that are afforded to them and the due process rights that may not be afforded to them since they're not citizens and kind of the tension there, if you could speak to that. You know, I would say it's imperfect. I'd say, I'd say before you get here, you really do not have Bill of Rights protections. And that's not to say we should abuse people who want to come here, but it isn't the same. So you don't have a right to come here necessarily. You have limited rights under our immigration law to come, and we have to have some of those rules. Can we keep the kids together? That's been a big issue. I'm sure we can do a better job than we have. But I will say it, it's sort of, if you want to talk about empty polarization, you know, like this woman yelling at me, kidnapper, and saying somehow I'm responsible for separating the kids, it didn't help me any. Comparing it to Auschwitz and Japanese internment isn't really helping either. It was the same policy under President Obama. The reason it's different now is we're detaining more people. Uh, President Obama had a much more lax policy towards who to prosecute. President Trump is prosecuting everybody from his mind to deter more people from coming, so more people are being separated. But it's the exact same policy on separation. He's just detaining a whole lot more people. And I think they're going about trying to fix that now, but um, you know, I think the response has been a little bit over the top, too. Do you have a comment on this? It's important also to keep in mind that there are, as I understand it, 26 points of entry for asylees to approach when they're coming through our southern border between San Diego and Brownsville. 26 places where they may lawfully come. And if they come in through one of those, they can have their application processed. And they're not under this uh, consent decree from the Flores case. And their families won't be separated at that point. Uh, if we could direct asylees to make sure that they come in through one of those lawful points of entry, rather than through a smuggling route or through some other illegal crossing point, I think that by itself would make a difference. Uh, or it's, it's still not a, a, a good idea, uh, and, it, and it shocks the conscience of most people who see it when people cross the border, even illegally, to have them separated from their children. So we're working on several pieces of legislation that would stop that from happening. One final note I would make on this is that um, completely lax enforcement of the border. Uh, as long as we have immigration laws, I do think they need to be enforced, and when we don't enforce them at all, we encourage more illegal immigration. That illegal immigration, in turn, has subjected a lot of people, especially women and children, to sexual assault along the way. Bad things happen when people send their children north uh, with, with people who are not their parents, um, uh, often alone, uh, often with paid smugglers. And the more time that goes by when we don't enforce the border, the more likely things like that will be to happen. And the more likely uh, uh, instances of exploitation and abuse are likely to occur. And very quick on the same issue, the only other thing I would say is that the more legal immigration or lawful immigration you have, the less illegal. So part of the answer is creating more avenues, more visas to come here, more green cards. And I don't know exactly my position, but I think we're similar in that we would have more work visas, but I'd also have more green cards. There's a lot of people who came here legally on a visa, uh, particularly Indian Americans, Chinese Americans, that are stuck on these country limits. I'd take off the country limits and I'd try to uh, uh, get them access into our system. So more lawful immigration is part of the answer what we need. Thank you, Senators. First off, I would like to thank you for your civil service to our country and also for your time here today. I would like to ask you about the authorization to use military force and how it pertains to Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, specifically with our war on the Taliban there. So according to the authorization to use military force, uh, the, the, the Commander-in-Chief may authorize military action against a terrorist threat, so long as, as that terrorist threat was a sponsor of the 9-11 attacks in any way. Uh, now. Um, in 2010, it is my understanding that General McChrystal, I believe it was 2010, General McChrystal um, reported to Barack Obama that um, Taliban and the threat in Afghanistan was so much that they needed more troops uh, deployed. Um, in general, uh, do you 
uh, or is there any evidence that Taliban was a, uh, a sponsor of the 9-11 attacks? Um, and it is to my recollection that they were an ally of Al-Qaeda. But is there any evidence that's, that supports that Taliban was, uh, was a sponsor of 9-11 attacks? And does that therefore justify military action under the authorization to use military force? Thank you. Well, I would say that initially they were a host, and there probably was some, some argument. But my question, is, if someone were making the argument now, is who is left in the Taliban that was a host? You know, so I think initially you could have made that argument. And the war against the Taliban, I think, was uh, justified in the sense that they were a host. Uh, there is still some debate over whether or not they would have compromised and there would have been something we could have done better. And, and probably there was some kind of discussion with the Taliban we could have done better. But I would say that now it no longer exists. And going back to the AUMF thing, I would say that somewhere along the line, people started talking about associated forces. It's very important to know that's not in any of the authorization support. That was made up by administration. I think first the Bush and then the Obama administration. The new AUMF, the Corker Kane AUMF, lets the president define associated forces anywhere in the world. This is a real danger, and the only way we could stop a new war with a new associated force would be to have a two-thirds vote. So this is a real problem we have with the new authorization that it turns things upside down, and really we think changes the Constitution and would be unconstitutional. I, I, I would add, I'm, I'm going to have to run because I'm late to a committee hearing, and my assistant Derek is back there with the baseball bat. He's going to come in. <laughs> No due process there, if you cross there. Um, I would add to that only by clarifying the, the new AUMF he's referring to, we should say, what it would do. Um, it has it not, it, it not yet been acted upon, and um, Senator Paul and I both feel that it should not be passed uh, because of this. But I just wanted to be clear, that's, that, that doesn't provide any current authority, but that, that's reason for us to be aware of it and I think to oppose it. Sorry I have to run. i got to get to this hearing. Senator Paul and Senator Lee, thank you so much for your time today. So my question goes to this definition of war in particular. So obviously we see in Federal 70 um, about the importance of an energetic executive as well. And so I guess my question then would be what methodology would you use to determine whether or not the president should get involved in something or if Congress needs to officially declare it as a war? And then I guess second of all, to what extent does a congressional declaration of war lend legitimacy to maybe a terrorist group or something and put it on par with um, a state enemy. And is there any concern there? Thank you. Um, I think that the president can respond to an imminent threat. But you know, this is, I, I asked President Obama about this because President Obama was very clear, I think it was to the Boston Globe in some questions when he was running for office. And he stated basically exactly my position. The Congress declared war, the president can only go if there's an imminent threat. And so I asked him at one of our lunches, I said, well, Mr. President, what about Libya? And his response to me was, uh, yes, Benghazi was under imminent threat of being attacked by Gaddafi. And I was like, really? I thought you meant imminent threat of the U.S. being attacked. If that's the standard, that would be the standard of any country, anywhere, any city, the president determining if they're getting ready to be attacked, he could launch a defensive attack. That's not what our founding fathers talked about. And so, yeah, there would be times. Obviously, in a nuclear war, the president has to have the ability to respond within 10 minutes, probably. And we hope that never, that kind of response never has to happen. So there are times, bombers heading this way, there are times when you would have a president act. But uh, some people argue, they say, oh, Congress is so feckless, we would never go to war, which might be a good thing. But there have been times when we were rightfully outraged and we went to war. 9-11, we voted. George Bush, and I disagree with a lot of things George Bush did, he came to Congress, and he asked for this 9-11 authorization. And it was virtually unanimous. It happened very quickly. There was still some debate. The language was narrowed. But the right thing happened. When we were attacked on December 7th, uh, FDR came to a joint session of Congress. And this is what you should do. And he asked for a declaration of war. And it was nearly unanimous once again. So uh, I don't see a reason, almost never, you know. And Congress can come together. We really rallied. The Iraq War, I think, turned out to be a disaster and was destabilizing to the Middle East. And there was a vote, and it was a fairly close vote. And people to this day still talk about it. 
And it's one of the interesting topsy-turvy things where some might think, well, Democrats are less likely to go to war than Republicans. Interestingly, between uh, Trump and Clinton, I think there's a great deal of evidence that Clinton was much more likely to get us involved in another big war in Syria. She was a huge advocate. In fact, one of the WikiLeaks uh, emails that I think is more important than almost any of them is one from Podesta to Hillary Clinton. And in it, he says, we got to do something about, you know that Saudi Arabia and Qatar are directly arming ISIS. We need to do something to put pressure on them to stop. But they knew that was happening, and they knew that people we were giving funds to, and we were calling moderate people. We were taking weapons out of Benghazi and sending them to Syria. They were getting in the hands of really bad people. And uh, the last part of your question was, uh, could we give uh, credibility to groups? Um, now, if you got to go to war, you got to go to war. And I, I don't think you have to, and I think you can go to war against groups. Many people often said, oh, we can't declare war against uh, you know, Al-Qaeda. That's kind of what we did after 9-11. We, we declared war on those who attacked us and anybody associated with them. The problem is that it gets so tangential that all around the world, people are calling themselves Al-Qaeda, and they're really involved more in civil war than they are in plotting to attack us. Thank you, Senator. Um, so it seems like the media is the only thing that's holding um, the executive branch accountable for what they say. And keeping in mind that the executive, the executive branch is taken as the official source on national security and foreign policy. Um, and with the privatization of the media, and it seems like news sources have their own agendas. Like, how do you see moving forward with this problem? Um, I would agree with you that there hasn't been enough uh, support from Congress to be ambitious about keeping our power and not letting the president take it. But not just under this president, on, under every president. I would also say that there's a disease that presidents catch as soon as they win from both parties, is they tend to believe in the separation of powers and that powers should remain in Congress when they're in Congress, and then when they become president, they don't, not so much. And so really, Madison said that the way the separation of powers would work is one, the Constitution would divide the power up, but then it would stay separate because we would pit ambition against ambition. The president would always try to grab more power no matter who, who he or she was, Congress would always try to grab power, and they would butt heads, jealously guarding their power. It hadn't worked in the last 75 years. From the New Deal on, we gave up great economic and bureaucratic authority to the president. Some of it they took. FDR took quite a bit. Most of it was ruled unconstitutional until about 37 when he finally got control of the court. And then once he had complete control of the court, everything became constitutional that was five years ago unconstitutional. So economically, the president grabbed a lot of power. Um, I think Napolitano in one of his books says we didn't overturn anything in the Supreme Court on the, using the Commerce Clause to expand power from 37 to like 93. Then the court starts to whittle a little way using the Commerce Power and said you can't do that. And even in Obamacare they said you couldn't use the Commerce Clause, but then they let them use the Tax Clause, so they kind of did it. But the, the, the bureaucratic state expanded, then also on foreign policy. But there are a group of us pushing back. Like you said just the media. I mean, Mike and I are both Republicans, and we have pushed back against, uh, we don't direct it at President Trump, but we direct it at the presidency, whether it's Trump or Obama. I did it under President Obama on indefinite detention. That's sort of an executive power of arresting people at a trial. We've been pushing back for six years on this. We did it for four or five years under President Obama. We're doing it under uh, President Trump as well. And so I think there is a group, and we work with people on the left, on, on Fourth Amendment uh, practices, on whether or not stuff on your cell phone should be yours unless a judge signs a warrant for it. Mike and I have done that, but I work very closely with Ron Wyden, who's great on it. I agree with Ron Wyden on almost everything on the Fourth Amendment, even though he's a progressive Democrat and I'm a conservative Republican. So I think the false narrative that some people paint out there is, one, we don't work together, and that we're always yelling at each other. People yell at each other all the time on the Internet. We almost never do. And in fact, the only time we ever end up having, and when, when it's sort of family debate, when it's a uh, Republican caucus and we're talking to each other, we have more significant disagreements. But Republicans and Democrats, with Senator Wyden, I know that I disagree with him on a lot of things, but I know I really agree with him on the Fourth Amendment. And so we tend to talk about the things we agree on and we kind of avoid the others. Maybe one more. Uh, hi, Senator. Thank you for uh, speaking with us today. Um, so your answer to the last question actually ties well into my question right now, and it's about practicality. Um, so there were themes of you know, less government in the people's lives, and um, obviously throughout history, um, the people have given more power to the government. And um, w there's a lot more entitlements, uh, most recently and probably most significantly Obamacare. Um, so once you entitle someone to something, it's near impossible to take it away. 
And um, so in order to make progress, like uh, how, how would you recommend going about, like what's the plan to, you know, get more power into the hands of the people and less in the government? You talk about trying to get rid of an entitlement, sort of like trying to get rid of a government job. And Reagan had this great story. He said, yeah, a government job is the closest thing to immortality. And he says, yeah, they uh, had a job in England. They started in 1812 and they put a guy in the of Dover and he had a bell. And he used to ring the bell if he saw Napoleon coming. And he finally got rid of that job in 1945. It's very hard to get rid of even, you know, a job of somebody ringing a bell. And, um, with regard to entitlements, this is one thing I would say, not to be provocative for those who support Medicare for all, but here's the one question I would ask you. Medicare for some is what we have now, mostly for people over 65. It's short $35 billion. It's actually trillion dollars, over $35 trillion over the next 20 or 30 years. Uh, Social Security is short $7 trillion. Now you can say you want these programs to do a lot more, Really, you have to tell me how you're going to do it. Medicare for all would be very, very expensive and would cost money, so you'd have to either have higher taxes or more debt. Those are your two choices. And we already struggle to pay for the entitlements we have. So if you're on the left and you say we need more entitlements, tell me how we're going to pay for the ones now. The other thing is, is I think right and left can come together on some of this. I sat next to a, a young woman who's a congressman from New York the other day and, at a dinner, and I told her, to save Social Security, you have to raise the age. Same with Medicare. You have to raise the age. The sooner you do it, the better. You can do it gradually, a couple of months a year, but you really have to go to 70 for Social Security and Medicare if you want to save them. And she didn't disagree. So, I mean, I think there are people on both sides saying, and it, and it shouldn't be a partisan issue. I didn't mess up Social Security. I didn't mess up Medicare. Republicans didn't do this. Neither did Democrats do this. I always tell people, if you want to blame somebody, Blame your grandparents for having too many damn kids after World War II. <laughs> <laughs> and then the fault is then your parents didn't have enough kids, and then you guys are not having enough kids. We've got smaller and smaller families, and all those baby boomers are retiring. There's nobody's fault. It's an actuarial problem that can be fixed like this. And the sooner we start doing it, the more gradually you can do it. In 83, when we finally raised the age from 65 to 67, it was because there was no money left. Even the surplus, everything, even the so-called surplus in Social Security was gone and then they changed the age. So some of it was bipartisanship, but some of it was because the till was running dry. That's gonna happen in the next five to seven years, and there was a report from Social Security the other day saying it's speeding up. I think we could take the entitlements and sort of have a compromise, because the, the argument of whether the private sector's gonna do it or the government's, that was the argument back in the 30s. Now we aren't really arguing to get rid of entitlements, we're, we're trying to argue how to make them financially sound and raising the age and you have to means test them. We already, we already means test Medicare, we have to do more of it. And uh, you know, uh, most of you in the room will make enough money probably that you would have to be means tested. That's just the way it's gonna work because we don't have enough money. Thanks everybody.